Thank you. All right. Well, we will welcome everyone uh, to week four of Old Testament Prophets 2. We we're off last week for Labor Day, so it's good to be able to come back together this week. And um, we should be able to catch up with having missed a week last week with the section that we're in. But before we get into any of the text, I always want to start with a prayer, ask the Lord's uh, blessings on our study, ask him to be present with us. So, Kirk Sr., if you would, would you unmute and pray for us as we get ready to study? I'd be delighted. You are the Almighty God, God, our Heavenly Father, wonderful Counselor, glorious King. And tonight we are so blessed and privileged to be in the Holy of Holies with you and have the confidence that we are your children washed in the blood of the Lamb, filled with the Holy Spirit, heaven-bound. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor that is due to you, even from our feeble lips. We are amazed that you accept our praise and accept our glory. You don't need it. You will still be glorious if we never said a thing. But we have the honor and the privilege of heeding your command to praise your name. And we are amazed, we are just amazed at the, the wonder of your word, this glorious prophet, the prophet Isaiah. And so tonight, thank you for Kirk and bless him and all, all of us, Father, as we seek to, to see you more clearly than ever before. We live mm -hmm. in a time that's very much like Isaiah. Help us to see the power and the glory and the assurance that he would give his people and you can give us from this great book. We are our most blessed people. You honor us and, pray and, and bless us in ways that we can never fathom, never understand, never even know about because you are our God and our Father. Bless us now. Help us to have open hearts. Help us to be sensitive to the speaking of your spirit to our hearts. Help us to never, ever quench the spirit, but to know that you are God, that you are in charge, and that when you gave the assurance to the, the people in the long ago, in the days of Isaiah, you can give that same assurance to us even to, in today, in a day of uncertainty, in a day of evil and wickedness, in a day when your word and your love is disregarded. So bless us now, Father, and open our minds to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, thank you, Kirk. Well, <clears throat> two weeks ago, uh, we got up to chapter 12 and uh, appreciate input from the class. I had some discussions here, and Kirk, Kirk Sr. made some good suggestions about since we're handling so much text, maybe some some uh, improvements in the way that we approach it could be helpful. And so uh, implementing those tonight, we should be able to uh, possibly even catch up almost two units. Uh, unit three goes through chapter 29. So we will be very close. Uh, I've uh, talked more, deep dialogued more with uh, Dare on that side, on the Houston side, to coordinate uh, how we're going to approach it. And uh, Dare, even though we're pretty well starting at Chapter 12, Dare uh, had two quick uh, reflections to make uh, on uh, chapter 10 and chapter 11. And so there, I'll let you go ahead and unmute and share those 
uh, reflections there. On on chapter 10, it was simply to note that uh, this is one of those cases where uh, when the Bible text got divided up into chapters, um, for whatever reason, they seem to have missed it here. Um, first three or four verses of chapter 10 clearly belong more to chapter 9 than they do to the rest of chapter 10. Uh, and this is a phenomenon that you run into, uh, not commonly, but um, regularly in reading scripture. Um, you, you need to keep in mind when you're reading a passage, follow the subject, not the chapters and the verses marks. Uh, it's, it's impossible to understand how that slip could occur, but it did. Uh, and you will occasionally find that um, when you start the, a chapter, uh, it doesn't really make sense until you connect it to the preceding verses of the previous chapter. Uh, and so just, just to note that. And then in chapter 11, I, there was a discussion about the... Uh, restoration and return of Israel, the fact that the 11 tribe, the 10 northern tribes uh, were, were never regrouped. Um, but uh, the, the whole scheme of 10 in the north and two in the south is an artificial arrangement. When you look at a map of the settling of the tribes, Simeon is south of Judah. Um, so if you split at Benjamin, you have Benjamin, Judah, and Simeon, which is nine. And then you got to remember there weren't 12 tribes or 13 tribes. And so the number 12 is always artificial. Uh, remember when you list the names of the tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh were not sons of Jacob. They were grandsons of Jacob. Joseph got the the senior brother's inheritance, a double portion of what his other brothers got, so he could give a whole portion to each son. So you really have 13 tribes. Uh, and so the split is more like nine to three uh, uh, for 12, and it's actually more like nine to four when you consider that most people take the view that a lot of the Levites, which were the non-landed tribe, uh, moved south to Judah as the northern tribe became more and more paganized. Uh, and uh, there are clearly names of northern tribes in the list of the returnees. And when the tribe of Judah came back from captivity, remember there was only a small number of them that came back, Remember, there were some of them that had never left. Uh, and they were never a nation. They were never a self-running country. They were a province ruled by others. So there wasn't any real restoration of the nation of Israel, even when they came back from captivity, for anybody, let alone the, quote, 10 lost tribes. Uh, just to note that in chapter 11. Okay, you can take off. With well, thank you, thank you, Dare. And I think it's it's worth noting that uh, when Dare said they're like the quote the ten lost tribes because much can be made of that in other circles, but uh, they were not all lost. You have uh, Paul uh, in the New Testament is of the tribe of Benjamin. Um, it's uh, so it's sometimes we'll we'll see things. Uh, not so much in scripture there may be a somewhat of a basis of it there but then a lot will get made of it in the in the christian circles and we as dara is saying we always need to go back and and look carefully read scripture well i wanted to just reflect real quickly uh uh chapter if i can get to six it's better to just go this way remember in six uh 
here in verse three, holy, holy, holy is the Lord almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Uh, we noted, and I went back and read this again, uh, that they were calling to one another. So they're not calling this out to God. It's like uh, one teacher said, it's like us having to tell someone uh, the awesomeness or majesty of what we're seeing and they're voicing this to to one another uh he's holy he's holy he's holy the earth and we noted there the present tense verb the earth is full of his glory so i mentioned that in the sense of let's let's always pull up short of talking about just how uh, almost like apocalyptic our landscape is, how bad things are, no matter where we are. And even as was noted last time, even in the, it doesn't matter, in the inner city, in, in whether it's a borough, whether it's a ward, uh, we can see some of the glory of God there. The earth is full of his glory. So present tense, and then quickly to 11, uh, and it's 11 verse. Uh, they will neither harm nor destroy on all of my holy mountain for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea and so future tense there currently if we have the eyes to see there's the glory of the Lord all around us uh, but there will come a time when uh, it will new creation. We'll see that in Isaiah 65, 66, 2 Peter 3, Revelation 21, new earth, new heavens, new earth. It, it will be full, filled with the knowledge of and the glory of the Lord. So we see both present and future tense. Well, go to 12, and uh, I still welcome uh uh, any of you at any point, if you have something to uh, share, please don't hesitate uh, to raise your hand on the screen. Uh, somebody unmute and get get my attention if I miss it. Uh, but uh, again, your sharing always enriches what we study. But otherwise, I'll just I'll go on through. I'll pause later on for Dare to come back with uh, a few other uh observations but in chapter 12 pretty well where we left off just a, a couple of things uh there a verse that you uh you may be familiar with have heard in some form surely god is my salvation i will trust and not be afraid the lord the lord himself is my strength and my defense uh or my salvation version he has become my salvation. Uh, not be afraid. Most common uh, command in scripture, don't be afraid. So we see a lot of that because the Lord knows that we need that reassurance that we're prone to fear. And especially when we take our eyes off of him. Uh, but look at verse three. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Now, this is... Uh, you know, this is, as, as we've said, with uh, with a number of prophecies, there are some degrees in which there are some near fulfillments, multiple tiers of, of fulfillment. Uh, I've likened it. I don't think I said this two weeks ago when we were living in Kenya from 84 to 99. The first 10 years we live out in the western part of Kenya towards the Ugandan border. And our house looked east towards the Cherangani Hills. We call them the hills. But for us in a lot of Texas there, the hills were 12,000 feet high. Uh, and from where we were down in a valley in Katali, we looked up. It was at 6,200 feet, so over, over a mile high, higher than Denver. Uh, but then it rose another 6,000 feet. To those hills 20 miles in the distance so there were multiple tiers there were some near hills that were a bit higher than and then there were several tiers of them as they went up to the peaks of 12,000 uh and i think 
some of prophecy is like that, some near fulfillments that we can see, but in the distance, there's some even greater fulfillments. And I think this is one of them with, uh, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And what scriptures do any, any actions of Jesus in the New Testament or scriptures that, you know, that that might make you think of? What about John chapter four with Jesus uh, and the woman at the well? This is not quoted, but here he is almost literally doing this, uh, having her draw this water. She's talking about purely physical water. Jesus says, if you had known who it is talking to you, you would have asked and I would have given you living water. And so we see Jesus in the process of, of doing what uh, Isaiah is talking about here. And even beyond that, and this one I want to go to, to John 7. Uh, you go, Jesus at the feast, <laughs> verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. But I just think it's such a beautiful passage and one that we always need to keep in mind. If you're thirsty, come to me. Uh, as scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And here back in Isaiah, he's saying, we'll draw with joy, we'll draw water from this well of salvation. It is the gift of the Spirit given to us, bubbling up. Uh, welling up to eternal life and uh, just the, the the great picture theme there of living water, not stale, stagnant water from a pool or a pond, but fresh flowing water. I preached in Stanton, Texas yesterday and I'd never, Susan and I had never been to the Davis Mountain area so we went down a night in Alpine went to Marfa uh, up through Fort Davis and stopped at Balmoray briefly. Balmoray, it's known for at the state park there, there's a, a huge spring of water. Uh, I didn't get to see it because the park was closed. It was early enough. We were getting to the preaching appointment in Stanton. My dad has been there and said, you know, about four feet wide and uh, 10, or, 10 or 12 feet long, this place where the water uh, wells up and it has for years. And this picture, this image of water welling up, and that's that's like the Holy Spirit within us, this fresh, this source of life-giving water uh, welling up. And so I just think that's such uh, such an important, uh, you know, picture and imagery that we should keep in mind there. And, and I think even Psalms refers to it in Psalm 36, 8 and 9, uh, speaking of this kind of living water. Well, wanted uh, to share that with you. Uh, please don't hesitate if you have any uh, response or reflection. I'll carry on for now. Remember from the video, the Bible Project video we looked at two weeks ago, and some of the divisions of what we're going through in the book up here, 1 through 12, Judgment and Hope for Jerusalem. 13 through 27, judgment and hope for the nations. Uh, and our text will pretty well go through 29 tonight. So that's that's pretty much all of it about what section that we're in now, the first part. And notice it's not judgment only. God, uh, he always tends to mercy. And God uh, is always calling to restore He's never out to annihilate. He always is, is calling uh, people to restoration. So judgment and hope, not only for Jerusalem, for Israel, but also for the nations, even for the very ones, Assyria and others, uh, who would be decimating 
uh, the people. And so we'll see that. I just wanted you to keep that broad uh, uh, picture in mind there of what we'll be covering. And so if you look uh, in in 13, as we as we go on, you'll see the first is against uh, Babylon. Now, they were they were a rising power. The Assyrians uh, were at the time those that were invading the land and points outside of Jerusalem. But Babylon was on the rise. And he goes into uh, a prophecy against Babylon uh, for their arrogance, for their pride. Uh, you can see in 1311, uh, uh, there. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for the sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and humble the pride of the ruthless. Uh, and that's one of the common themes uh, where he talks about the ruthlessness when there's no mercy. Uh, we'll go on to 14. And 14 and uh, 12, the whole text is... Uh, is about Babylon, so keep that in mind. Uh, and then 14, uh, especially 12 and following, uh, you'll see some in your notes about this uh, that refers to the morning star, son of dawn. Uh, uh, and so, you know, a number of teachers take this and and say, well, there, yes, may be an initial application to Babylon, but beyond that, talking about the fall of Satan. So that was another one of the areas where uh, there uh, is going to have some input. So there, and let you come back online there. And uh, I think one of the main issues that you uh, were going to address here in chapter 14. So, barring uh, any, go ahead. Just to point out that uh, this is one of those places where we re we really need to pay attention to what the writer wrote. Uh, he's very specific about the purpose for which he wrote. Uh, and then you need to understand this material. This is 8th century BC uh, Middle Eastern poetry. Uh, the, the writer says this is, um, uh, how does your uh, translation translate uh, that word? Uh, the, the one I looked at first, had the, this is a taunt. Um, the word is uh, the word that's frequently translated parable or riddle. Uh, th this passage is a parody on the pride and the arrogance of Middle Eastern kings, particularly in this case, Babylon's king. And therefore, you're going to get all kinds of deliberately, extravagantly exaggerated terminology. Uh, and so there's no, there's no need to try to see how this quote fits or doesn't fit because uh, um, of the qualities that are ascribed to it. Uh, and those who use this passage to, to apply this to the, uh, to the uh, fall of Satan uh, start with the premise that it has to be something besides the king of Babylon because the terminology here is, uh, you know, just wouldn't fit a king. Well, it's not intended to fit. This is an exaggeration. Uh, this is uh, Robin Williams or Jonathan Winters' riff on the king of Babylon. Uh, and, and when you assume 
that there's something else going on here, um, then you're making a, an assumption that the text doesn't give any indication that is true. Uh, there's no reason why this text can't be read simply as it is, an exaggerated taunt of the king of Babylon. Uh, and, and if you take that position and you don't then conclude that this really has to be about the power behind the king, i.e. Satan, you don't have the morning star, which in Latin is Lucifer, as a name for the devil. And yet you look in Bible dictionary after Bible dictionary and you'll find, based on this passage, that one of Satan's name, and I saw one source said, this was his name. All the other terms, devil, Satan, those are descriptive terms of him. His name was Lucifer, based on this passage. Uh, and that for me becomes troublesome because the Greek word that is used to translate this morning star is used twice in the New Testament in reference to Jesus. And if you don't think the modern day Satan worshipers haven't noticed that, you haven't read their literature. Uh, they make great hay out of the fact that the Christians believe Lucifer is the morning star, is the bright shining star. Uh, and they're more than happy to confuse you over who's Lucifer and who's the Messiah. Uh, oh, good. Thank you, Darrell. Well, we've got a couple of people. Uh, Kurt Sr. first. I think the best uh, way to do it was in a phrase that we learned in hermeneutics was there is only one interpretation, but there are many applications. And I think that's that's been helpful to me. My text says in verse 16 of chapter 14, the man. I mean, this is this is what we know. This is the man. Uh, it says it again in 17, the man. And so interpretively, we will say this is the king of Babylon. But I think I don't think it's unwise or neither uh, unpermitted for us to say you can apply this to First Timothy 3 or you could apply it to John 8, 44, or you could apply it to uh, Acts 13 uh, when Paul is on, on the island. Uh, he talks to Elymas. Again, you are of your father, the devil, uh, Paul, Jesus says. And I, I, I just think one interpretation, many, I mean, one, one interpretation, many applications. I think that's legitimate. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah, thank you, Kirk. Uh, Emmanuel. Yes, thank you. Um, I know, as you say, uh, um, the morning starts attributed to Lucifer. What about the um the one that speaks about Jesus, the morning star in Revelations, and I think somewhere else in the New Testament, I'm not sure, maybe in Timothy or something. Yeah, First, how, second Peter. What, sorry, second Peter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what was uh, it referring to when it speaks about Jesus and morning star? Yeah. I think that's part of Dare's point. Uh, Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16. Uh, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches on the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Uh, I think that is part of the point Dare, Dare was making uh, when we take and apply uh, the Greek term Lucifer and say it, it is, uh, make its definition Satan's their further input from you on that uh yeah and the point in both of those passages in second peter and revelation the figure is applied to jesus as the first the earliest 
the morning star in the ancient world, it's still an astronomical thing, uh, the planet Venus frequently shows up right on the horizon, right at sunrise. And so it's almost a harbinger, or the sun's almost up, the sun's coming. Uh, and that, that makes it an apt figure to apply to Jesus. Uh, and I, I just think since two writers do that in the New Testament, it really messes it up to use the same term in the Old Testament and say that's really, that's, that, that's the devil. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's a, there's a secondary side to that. The Hebrew word that lies behind this, uh, which is why the Hebrews probably applied it to the Venus coming up uh, as shining one or light bearer or clear, uh, got used in the context of uh, showing off of boasting. And so the term may be used here as a literary device. Uh, oh, boaster, <laughs> you arrogant, proudful boaster, uh, your boasting is going to come to nothing. No. Uh, well, very good. And and of course, I'm. Our, we could go on longer, but we know we're just trying to limit and control our time, but just appreciate it. Good, good input. The admonition going back here uh, of what Dare started off with, uh, this taunt against the king of Babylon. It's all we see those things in, in the context. Uh, read these uh, uh, in, in their context. And then keep in mind things like what Kirk Sr. was saying, too. Uh, there are some where there are multiple applications. Are there any uh, are there any principles that he talks about here against the King of Babylon that could uh, that uh, might apply to uh, to the devil and his pride or his arrogance? Well, sure there are, but we don't make this text primarily uh, about that. Well, having to go on. So in fourteen, uh, you go further down. Uh, to 24, uh, it's, it's still about Assyria. Then you get to 28, about Assyria there. Uh, I will crush the Assyrian in my land. Now, all of this judgment against Assyria, but just wait a little bit until we get to 19 uh, for proof that God is concerned about all nations and even showing mercy, giving messages of hope not just to Israel, the Philistines. So prophecy against them here in the latter part of, of 14. you got to keep going. So uh, move on through 15. There was input again, so I don't think now, I don't think uh, uh, I will skip over anything there, but if there's, if there's something as we go that you also wanted to comment on, of course, just speak up. But look, when I talked about uh, God's heart, look at verse uh, 15, verse 5, about Moab. My heart cries out over Moab. Uh, this is not just a picture of God pouring out his vengeance on them, ready to decimate them. Even with these, these quote, nations, uh, the heart of God is to see healing and restoration. 16 uh, keeps going. And this is talking about Moabite refugees. Uh, look at verse, uh, verse 4 here. Let the Moabite fugitives stay with you. Be their shelter from the destroyer. Destroyer, don't think just in terms of the devil, but from all of those who would oppress, in this case, like the Babylonians. So here you have it. Let, let these fugitives stay with with you well when you expand your picture of old testament story who was a moabite fugitive or refugee that comes into the lineage of jesus of course there's ruth the moabitess and let them stay among you and uh and so we have that that whole story there uh in ruth 
uh, that you know we want to keep in mind when we see something like this here. Uh, you go down to verse five. Uh, let me highlight it here. In love, a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it, one from the house of David, one who, in judging, seeks justice and speeds the cause of righteousness. Well, I think one thing to note right off is how will this throne be established? In love, uh, not anger, not vengeance, not hate for others. In love, this throne will be established looking towards a future time. Someone from the house of David, well, uh, there was no good fulfillments from any of the remaining kings from the house of David. Uh, we move on up to Jesus, though, from the line of David and see this happening. So in love, think of what? John three sixteen, God so loved the world he gave. Uh, and notice this, one who in judging seeks what? Vengeance? No, justice. Uh, not giving people what they deserve. Uh, so think of Hebrews. It talks about the blood of Jesus is superior to the blood of Abel. Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. Jesus' blood cries out for forgiveness. What were his words on the cross? Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And in judging, he seeks justice. What about John A, when the adulterous woman was brought to Jesus? Uh, Jews were just looking for a way to trap him. They could care less about the woman. They would have, they would have been fine with stoning her. But Jesus, as he judges, he seeks what? true justice uh he challenges them uh you know calls their injustice on the carpet they're confronted with it they walk away uh though then he's had you know says to her where are they that accuse you uh there are none go and leave your life of sin so john 4 john 8 we see jesus doing that uh uh, let me push that a little bit, because uh, I think I completely forgot something. Um, no, we haven't gotten to it yet. Um, he's judging, seeking justice, and speeding the cause of righteousness. Hang that righteousness on a peg. Because later on in Isaiah, we're going to come to a very, very intriguing passage about righteousness. And we'll come back to this. Good. Thank you. Good to do that. I love, I love seeing that in Scripture. Saying, remember that, bookmark that about righteousness because it's going to show up on the stage in a significant way later on. Uh, carrying on. Uh, so just great passages there. It's, it's not that there's nothing else for us to look at in these, but as we've said, having to move along against Damascus. So, of course, you should think Syria. Uh, Damascus, the capital uh, of Syria. Uh, and... Uh, of course, we still have Syria with us in our world today, all of the uh, terrible civil war there and uh, people that have suffered so much, our family in Christ. Uh, I pray that we all, uh, all uh, slow way down anytime we hear about these. Uh, well, I mean, you've got floods in Libya today. Uh, you've got a huge earthquake in Morocco. So these are both North Africa. We can, again, if we have, I think, a poor uh, eschatology, a poor understanding of end-time events, we will almost get excited about these things. And like, oh, wow, look, end-time signs. Uh, 
as if we have no heart for what the people are suffering. Early on, years ago, when the war in Syria started, Christians were discussing and some were excited about this. And it's like, God forbid that that would be our response. We not it, it doesn't matter if they're family, if they're family in Christ, and there are a lot of Christians there, but even Muslims, nobody deserves a living hell of war and uh, the all of the displaced people as a result. And so I pray that as we see things like this, there's never any gloating in our heart or like, oh yeah, that's a that's that's a support of the views that I have about end times. Uh, Ezekiel, we'll see later on next semester, God takes no delight in the death of even the wicked. So 17, uh, Damascus, Syria, uh, verse 7, in that day, people will look to their maker and turn their eyes to the Holy One of, of Israel, uh, speaking even to people there. They will not look to the altars, the work of their hands. Uh, speaking of a day to come, a time to come, and of course it does arrive uh, fully in Christ. And then you do have people uh, from nations. You take Acts chapter 2 alone, and I forget the count, but 15 to 20 nations mentioned at Pentecost there in Acts chapter 2, and certainly some from Syria, Damascus. Uh, okay, uh, go on. Uh, to 18, Kush. So roughly Ethiopia, you can correct me or if you if you think I've uh, uh, understood it differently there. So uh, that's uh, that's the usual designation. Southern Southern Egypt at least. Yeah. So you have here go swift messengers to a people tall and smooth skin, uh, of course, still characteristic of Ethiopians. We worked in Kenya, so you have a lot of the Bantu people uh, that are below the Sahara and down. Uh, Nilotic peoples are those that migrated down like the Nile. They tend to be taller. The Ethiopians, Eritreans, uh, not only are taller, but they're a lighter lighter skin, most of them. So that's that's still uh, an apt description. Um, so these, and there will be a little bit more. We move on down. Uh, uh, verse 4, uh, this is what the Lord says to me. I will remain quiet and look down from my dwelling place. Move on down to verse 7. At that time, gifts will be brought to the Lord Almighty from a people tall and smooth skinned, from a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech. This land is divided by rivers. Uh, well, uh, and I don't think as I seek to make some application on into uh, what, you know, what God did, because all of this is pointing towards its light again. Um, I think the mission statement of the of the brothers and sisters at uh, Bible Project in Oregon, we believe uh, the Bible is a uh, you know a united whole, a a story that that points us to Jesus, that leads us to Jesus, and so these it says at that time gifts will be brought uh, to the Lord Almighty from these people. Well, what about uh, in Acts there where we see um, Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. The eunuch came from Ethiopia and uh, came to worship in Jerusalem in a sense brought gifts, but no greater gift than to be reading. And he's reading from the prophet Isaiah when Philip goes up to him in the chariot. And, and so I think that's one little glimpse that we can see uh, as it plays out even in uh, the book of, of Acts. Uh, go on. Uh, anybody raise, raise your hand, have something to say, please feel free. Go on to 
19, so that we said we're all in the, the nations here, this judgment and hope for the nations against Egypt. So Egypt uh, had a strong cult of death, uh, is what, of course, is even behind much of the pyramids, uh, burial chambers. So there was a, a strong cult of death uh, there. Uh, and and it, so it's not any hatred for the people, but it is judgment on these strongholds, structures that hold people in darkness. So let me just real quickly go to Hebrews 2. Uh, I just always, because I'm not turning there in my Bible, I have it marked. Uh, um, so, 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared Jesus. Jesus is greater than all of these things in Hebrews. He too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now, that still applies to people around the world, our time in Africa, whether it was the uh, Hindu friends that we, we developed there and sitting with some of them at the time of death, or our Sikh friends, uh, Kenyans, Africans themselves. Uh, we, uh, you know, a lot of us as Americans, we can have a fear of death, and Jesus came to break that hold, that that fear uh over the one who holds the power of death and people who were held in slavery by their fear of death. Well, that goes back to what's at the heart of God's judgment against Egypt is breaking this, this uh, power hold, this stronghold, this fear of death that it held people in. Um, go on, um, because there's a big thing here at the end of my meeting. So keep going. Uh, uh, these are Egyptian officials, uh, of course. Uh, Kirk, can I ask you a quick question? John, go ahead. You know, and everything we do, of course, is for the study, for it to, to enrich our lives, but also for us to be stronger, to spread the gospel. And it went back. You said you sat with, a, a Sikh that was dying. Is that what you said? Uh, one who one who passed, uh, a Sikh friend there in in Katali. Uh, if I can time. ask, um, I, I found that amazing. How how did you how, how did you try to witness to them? If you don't mind me asking, because I think it's important that we also know that. I, I just I find that fascinating, and and uh, I just I heard that, and I would really like to know how how you navigated that yeah well sean good good question of course i was a youngster then i was about 24 25 so still uh very very green and may have gone about things a, a little differently now some decades later but part of our part of our witness to them was being there among them uh be befriending them um uh, being with them, uh, weeping as as we you know hear uh, in scripture, weep with those who weep, uh, and so in that particular case, at that because uh, I was uh, I was simply a guest among, and they had uh, being Sikhs, they had their holy men there and all of the uh, rituals that they were going through, so they they had the floor. So at that particular time and quote his uh, service uh all, all i could be was an, an observer but on the in the bigger scheme of it sean I, we we did it by developing relationships with them having meals with them and and uh they you know they knew why we were there uh as missionaries and 
and it did. One family in particular, we were able to have a more direct impact on that joined us in our worship, our devos together, and uh, but uh, didn't didn't have the same opportunity with them to always make the clear proclamations that we did with the uh, African family that that we were there with. But we still, of course, cared about them and tried to find ways to speak of Jesus to them. I think it's still important because you were invited, no matter what, obviously, to partake of that. That is still yeah. in itself right there. Well, it was. It was an honor. But what's the one thing that stood out to me there was just the, uh, and I sometimes use that as an, a dem as an illustration of the fear of death. I was just, I didn't take the time, but since you, you mentioned that, it is, uh, that was one of the things that it struck me was, I felt for them, my heart went out to them because of the lack of hope, the, 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 the just the lack of hope on their faces in the presence of death. Uh, and uh, that's one of the ways that we tried to convey that message through the years there that we have hope beyond death. Uh, let's go on down. Uh, as we'll see even in scripture later in the prophets, Hosea, the Lord tears for the purpose of healing. Uh, look at this. Uh, verse 22, the Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and what? And heal them. Uh, we can take the story of the Exodus and say, yeah, go get them, God. Uh, and we just like to maybe think of the decimation of a people, but that's never God's intent. His, his justice is not just a punitive justice to punish. It's a restorative justice. That's always the purpose of God's justice is to try to restore. And we see it with the Egyptians here. Uh, they will turn to the Lord and he will respond to their pleas and heal him uh, and heal them. Look at that. This is in Israel. This is the Egyptians. So look at this. This is what I love here. Uh, in that day, so there in the future, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Now, if you, if you ever, uh, if, you, if your vision ever fades for God's passion for the nations, bookmark this and come back to this, because I don't know that there is any better picture uh, in the Old Testament of God's concern for people. And look at the terms of endearment that's usually reserved for Israel alone. The Lord Almighty will say, blessed be Egypt, my people. We normally don't hear that about anyone, but Israel, my people. Assyria, my handiwork. Israel, my inheritance. Well, of course, this in the Messianic age with Jesus and then after Pentecost and in the first uh, even a few hundred years of the church, uh, this was true. North Africa was a, 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 a very, the gospel took root deeply there. Augustine came, came from there. Uh, Egyptians worshiping God. And of course, we still have brothers and sisters in Egypt today. So I just want to make sure you highlight that in your in your Bible that don't don't ever let that go unnoticed. I just think uh, the language and all is just so beautiful, uh, showing us of what God uh, intended to do through Christ and what he uh, what he did in reality and is still doing. That's the thing. Two thousand years later, God is still doing this. So I will pause there. We're moving along okay at about 20 minutes to go uh any any reflection or response or further commentary there there anyone 
uh, only in reference to your emphasis in Egypt on the cult of death and your use of a Hebrew passage. Uh, there's a ground great breaking little book uh, by a British man, C.H. Dodd, on apostolic preaching in which he goes through the New Testament to demonstrate that in contrast to much of modern, even evangelical preaching, the emphasis of the apostles in their preaching was on the resurrection of Jesus in direct response to this Hebrew passage, people caught in the, in the slavery of the fear of death. The, the good news is that Jesus died and rose again. Um, in Acts 2, the very first gospel message, Peter took like one verse to say, you killed him. And all the rest of the sermon is about the resurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's, there's not even the emphasis upon uh, the sacrificial death, the atonement. The emphasis is upon the reality that Jesus rose. And that changes everything with respect to death. Good, good. Good further, important further reflection. Uh, uh, springboarding off of of what we noted from from Hebrews, and that is significant. And and I've heard that in different ways. Uh, I wouldn't have thought to bring it to bear on this right now, but that really is at the heart of the gospel. And we uh, we can make, and it's significant when he says C. H. Dodd noting that the the main focal point of apostles preaching and teaching was the resurrection we make it as he said more about the atonement the forgiveness of, of our sins uh personal relationship holiness but that's not the focus the 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 largest focus of uh of the apostles that the good news there is there is eternal life beginning here and now that enables us to overcome uh, our fear of death. And uh, I think part of the, the therapy of that, the therapeutic value, is it can help wean us off of such a fixation on our personal individual relationship with with God as if that's what the work of Jesus is all about, me and my relationship with God, to more of a, a larger corporate picture of humanity uh, that he's come to give hope uh, and to help them overcome this fear of death. Interesting that the Hebrew writer chooses that language there. Thank you, Dare. We'll go on to past 20. Egypt and Cush, geographically close, uh, Egypt and uh, Ethiopia. You go on, I don't think there was anything significant there. 21, uh, Babylon, Chaldea, uh, desert by the sea. Uh, so, uh, Again, Chaldeans, correct me, uh, uh, dare geographically if I'm wrong, but in the vicinity of modern day Iraq, because if you look at. Yeah, the Chaldeans uh, in the south. Yeah, further, further south and, and, and the. Chaldean, so, Babylon, Assyria, north, south to north. Yeah. Well, it could. I have that. I didn't think uh, to pull that up, but give me, we have the minutes, give me just a second on the fertile. Well, I can probably get to it quicker this way instead of searching. Uh, Let's 
So you would have uh, the crescent, the fertile crescent. So Mediterranean, you have uh, Galilee, Jordan, Dead Sea. So uh, Israel in here. And as we read the prophets, they often will talk about a flood coming from the north. Well, it's because Israel was on, uh, in a sense, the war path. It was right, is right on the crossroads because of the topography. Any armies uh, for Egypt over here, any of these uh, world empires, Assyria, Babylon over here, uh, really, in a sense, Israel was the stomping ground because they all had to pass through there on their way if they were fighting one another because out here to the east of uh, uh, the Dead Sea was uh, was just a uh, desert that they could not pass through. So, so the Persian Gulf down by the sea, the Tigris and Euphrates, uh, and so because of the fertility of the area and the water, uh, some of the capitals of the world empires uh, uh, were here. So maybe that is uh, a bit helpful. Probably should have pulled that up earlier uh, as we're as we're dealing with this. Of course, Egypt over here, uh, the Nile. Uh, so can go back to so twenty one. The Babylonians, the Chaldeans, uh, 24 is where you also had some more input uh, there. Uh, you go on down to verse 11 against Edom, the Edomites, uh, some of the descendants, uh, Esau, uh, and then Arabia the Dedanites. Um, you keep going then at you get to 22. Uh, prophecy about Jerusalem against Jerusalem. Uh, there, I'm sorry, 20, 22. Uh, Israel uh, they developed the, the malady, the sickness of relying on their military strength. Verse 8, the Lord stripped away the defenses of Judah, and you looked in that day to the weapons and the palace of the forest, this large uh, structure that Solomon built. Uh, so it's a warning against any of us, any of us, that includes us today as the U.S., if we put stock and put our hope and trust in our military strength or might, uh, keep going. Uh, go on down to 20, 20, 21, 22 here. Uh, now, in that day, I will summon my servant, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. Of course, so he gives very specific historical context there. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem. Uh, I will place on his shoulder uh, the key to the house of David. So notice the context. There is, of course, the immediate uh, direct application there. Uh, we take this, too, and we see some secondary or even tertiary fulfillment down the road in Jesus. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. What does that make you think of? Jesus. Uh, Revelation 3. Uh, so go on. Uh, 23, a prophecy against uh, Tyre. Uh, uh, so this was a seafaring people. Uh, Tyre, Sidon, uh, Arrogance, hubris, uh, hubris or hubris, uh, pride, 
uh, always will be uh, brought down. The Lord Almighty planned it to bring down her pride and all her splendor and to humble all who are renowned on the earth. Any people, again, nations become empires. And by saying that, that's what we see in Revelation. Nations become empires. And empires, by nature, they inherently begin to set themselves up against God. And that, that's happened to nations throughout history. We see it to some degree uh, in our own relying on our own strength, might. Uh, so go on to 24. Uh, I think we get here. Uh, I'm going to pause there, there, because I know you had some reflection on 24 here. Yes. Uh, everybody look at your translation in 24. Hey, Dare, uh, we're having a little bit, we're having a little bit of what we had last week with the garbled audio. If you would just, I guess, go ahead and pull that out of your USB port uh, on your computer and let's just let you use your laptop mic. It'll be clearer, I think. Okay. That's uh, better. The translation that you see on the screen is uh, lay waste the earth and devastate it. And this whole chapter is built on that a terminology as though this is a global thing. And I just wanted to point out that the, the Hebrews only had one word here and it frequently is translated earth and it's frequently translated land. And that's a translator choice. So when you see the word, you always need to raise the issue, is this necessarily talking about the earth, the globe, or is this possibly talking about the land? A more limited geographical area in, in particularly reference to the land of Israel, for instance. Uh, and that's always a struggle. And the translators know that. They, they have their reasons for which choice they make, but you won't find translators always agreeing on which one to make, which one to use. Uh, here, it, it, there seems to be a consensus among translators that Isaiah has, since he's now looked over all these nations, uh, and God's judgment. He can now talk about not just the land of Israel or Judah, which is his major ministry, but he, he can cover the whole world because he's spoken about nearly all of the countries they were aware of in the Middle East. Now, if you know your geography from that period of time, and you know the history in terms of the nations, you know there are a number of names missing from that list in 23 uh, up to through here. Uh, uh, Assyria, Babylon, uh, Damascus, Egypt, Kush weren't the only countries they knew about. Uh, and so, it's easy to, ex to accept this as now Isaiah has gone global, but always keep in mind, maybe not. Maybe this has a narrower geographical focus when you see the word earth. Good reminder. We we see a word like that and we think, oh, okay, the globe. But as Adair points out, well, sometimes translated the land, which would make sense in this context, even if it was land of the known world at the time, it's still regional yeah. in that sense, not not global. Uh you could you know could say, well, why would Isaiah be talking about uh the land of 
America or South North America, South America. Uh, and so note there, and then moving on to 25 there, because I know that he just talks about verse five, uh, uh, the earth, uh, the land is defiled by its people, violating the laws. And so all of these that God has talked about judgment, it, it makes sense to hear that uh, as land. So you move on to 25, and I know you have a reflection there. Uh, I'll let you go first in 25 there, and then I'll finish up with verses 6 and 7 there in 25. Uh, in, in 25, I, I simply wanted to point out uh, that uh, th this, this praise uh, that uh, is expressed um, somewhat future, I will exalt and praise your name. Uh, and then as this moves into the 26, where you have uh, God makes salvation. Uh, how verbs gets translated into English is again, a significant choice of the translator. Because as best we can understand Hebrew at this point, ancient Hebrew had no concern about times. They had two concerns in their verbs. And that was how to get you to see the action. It didn't make any difference how it happened. It's how does the writer want you to see it? Does he want you to look at it as a photograph or as a video? As something one-time picture or as an ongoing action? Uh, and they had various uh, literary techniques to try to give you hints about past, present, future, but the basic foc of their, focus of their verbs is simply this is the picture or this is the movie. Uh, and so frequently you can see what is expressed as future not necessarily future at all, but even present. Is God going to do this or is God doing this? And uh, same with respect to me. Is this something I'm going to do or something I'm doing? And here you easily could translate this. Lord, you are God. I exalt you. That's what I do. It's not just something I do based on particular issues. I, I do this. That's that's what I do. Okay. Thank you. Just one day, but that it is uh, our practice. You know, the writer saying there, I do this. I exalt you. And so look down there in verse six. Uh, uh, again, you have this picture of what Hebrews 2 was talking about. I love this again, this, this imagery uh, on this mountain. Uh, so we're not just talking about right there in Jerusalem uh, on, on that mountain, but this, uh, this establishment of God's reign here on earth. The Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. Seven, on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from their faces. He will remove from his people's, remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Uh, so what a beautiful picture there. Again, don't don't get hung up on making this geographic one place on earth, Jer Jerusalem, and then tie our whole eschatology to that because we miss, my goodness, we miss what God is doing if we do that. Uh, the, the thing that excites me is 
the way that God is doing this around the globe today, that people are coming together, this rich food that they have in the body of Christ, not literal food. And this isn't just literal wine and, and meat, but this is the, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and the, the richness of what people are enjoying today. And, and the way that, you know, he has removed the shroud, the sphere of death, Hebrews 2, that that enslaves all people, and he is wiping away their tears. Uh, I'll do a lesson here at Canyon Hills in our missions month in October about what God is doing in the Islamic world, and uh, he is doing this now. And so that's just, uh, I love the beauty of this, of this language here, not only uh, what it's not just at the time of Christ, but it's carrying through to our lives today. Yes, Kirk Sr. Well, I just, my my reflection here is that these nations all reflect the fact that we worship and love a God of all mankind. I think, I think sometimes our vision becomes, um, oh, dear Christian College, we love you, Abilene, Texas. I mean, uh, that's about all we can see. Or, hey, yeah. Uh, the eyes of Texas are upon you, and that's all there is in the world. But God, God is a God of all the earth. He is the God of all mankind. And Romans 2 speaks of that, and Acts 17 speaks of that. And when we go to look at the visions of heaven, Amen. It's, it's people of all the world. My God is a God that knows the thoughts and weight and, and cells and hairs of Every man from here to Antarctica and in between. I mean, it's just marvelous, the God that loves all mankind. And uh, I think he's saying to us, quit, don't be a, 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 a sort of a provincial Jew in this, me, myself, and I, and us, us four, and no more. This is the whole world, and that's who yeah. he loves, and that's who he's caring for. He is a sovereign God over all the earth. Amen. Amen. He yes. is. And he is revealing himself more and more. I met a wonderful gentleman, Dr. Uh, Nasar Siddiqui, Iranian, and prayed to Allah and revelation occurred and was converted on his almost getting ready to die. And Jesus revealed himself. And now he's one of the biggest proponents for trying to spread the gospel in Iran. So yes, he is here. He knows the thoughts. He is for all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you just go back to the Psalms and praise the Lord, all the nations, all you nations, the, the plural is used there so many times that God is passionate uh, for all people. As you take, um, take the picture in Revelation, it's used like three or four times. And so, okay. Uh, we will be finishing up. Let me just say real quickly, we've done really well. We've gone over, made up over half of what, and I, so I think we'll do fine next week. So two things here, uh, a verse that you may know well, you may have it on a plaque in the house. I had one for some years, a 26.3, you will keep in perfect peace. Those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Uh we we have a, a peace that permeates us as we trust in the Lord, but we have to be intentional about doing that. And then you see in verse eight, uh, uh, yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you, your name and renown are the desires of our hearts. Look at that. That should be the focus of many of our prayers, not just our needs, but God, your name, your renown, that's what my heart desires. That's the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, here on earth as it is in heaven. And let that be our passion, uh, praying, uh, asking in the name of Jesus that God's name be great, his name and fame be great on the earth. So I was going to finish by Going to ah, uh, it was right there. Uh, if it doesn't come to mind, I'll have to leave it, and I probably will think of it 
and can start with it just quickly at the beginning of next week wasn't oh yes sorry we're talking about god and in, in all nations so revelation um five and we have this several times uh in in revelation uh they sang a new song uh saying you're worthy to take the scroll to open his seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for god persons from every tribe and language and people and nation you've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our god and they will reign on the earth this people from every tribe language people and nation uh he's very intent about saying these aren't just politically bounded nations these are people groups on the earth and jesus's code of many colors is not complete until there's people from every tribe, every people group, uh, you know, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants only cannot bring God all of the glory he deserves. Blacks alone cannot bring God all of the glory he deserves, nor can Latinos. It takes all of us together uh, to bring God all of the glory that he deserves for Jesus to have his coat of many colors, his robe of nations. So that's just kind of uh, amening in a strong way what Kirk Sr. was saying. Well, we have to stop there. I've got five minutes to shift over to the next class. Uh, great study together. Thank you all uh, for your input. We did great. We're moving along. So uh, we will see you next week. Until then, the Lord bless you, be with you. Also with you, thank you. And don't everyone forget, you can also rewatch these because it's a lot of information. Very good. Good, good night. night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.